First Friday Forum on closing the digital divide in Lancaster County. I'm Diana Martin. I'm the executive director here at Hourglass. And it's my pleasure to be joined today by Lisa Riggs, the president, and Ezra Rothman, director of strategic partnerships and initiatives at the Economic Development Company of Lancaster County. That's a mouthful. I think I got it right. <laughs> um, so since 2021, EDC has been working in partnership with the Lancaster STEM Alliance on a effort to develop a broadband strategy for Lancaster County. Part of that effort entailed uh, getting a national consultant to do a study on broadband here in Lancaster. So Lisa and Ezra will be presenting some of the results of that study today and where, how, where we move forward as a community to uh, keep that moving. After they present, we will have an opportunity for some questions from both people in the room and everyone who's joining us on the live stream. If you're joining us on the live stream, please just drop your questions in the chat and I will monitor those. So thank you so much, Lisa and Ezra, for being here today. I'd also like to thank our First Friday Forum sponsor, Rogers & Associates, for their support, and Millersville University and the Ware Center for hosting us today. Thank you. All right, I will take it from here. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Lisa Riggs with EDC. First of all, let me just uh, acknowledge my board member and Hourglass board member, Liz Martin here, who's serving as our vice chair. Good to see you, Liz. <laughs> <laughs> um, and thanks to Hourglass, we appreciate the forum today. Uh, we know there's some people viewing online as well as everyone that waddled here or swam or canoed here to get here today. Thank you for carving out uh, an hour. Uh, we are going to be talking to you about uh, the broadband work that we've been doing in partnership with the STEM Alliance um, and really hoping to hear questions and have some conversation at the end uh, because that's where we uh, get some really good insights from observations that you all have. Um, I haven't been back to Hourglass for a little bit of time. Uh, I've been here many times before. Um, so I could be talking about industrial land scarcity. That's a popular topic right now. We could be talking about workforce. Uh, we're having a lot of fun dealing with water and sewer systems right now, a significant project volume. Uh, there's a whole lot of topics, so feel free to have it those two in the Q&A um, if you can't think of a broadband question. Um, <laughs> anything on the economy, we're happy to talk about. A lot of good things happening and a few challenges. Um, am I just hitting press? The, okay, yep. good. Yep. Oh, good. Okay. So, um, let me try. Okay, there we go. So, I'm going to do a little bit of stage setting and then Ezra's going to jump into the key aspects of our report um, and then we'll talk, wrap up with some next steps. Uh, there's a couple of quotes that we start off with on our presentation, and, and the reason we do this, although I, I would like to think in this room we don't need to, is that not everyone understands why broadband is important. Frankly, what even broadband is, right? We're talking to a lot of different audiences across communities. Uh, so for our purposes, at, and as we speak, what we, when we talk about broadband, we're talking about high-speed, high-quality internet, and that that access should be for all. Uh, across our community. And by our community, we're talking about Lancaster County as a whole. Uh, and that ranges from rural and ag to urban and uh, north, south, east, west, right? So this is our point is right now, the reality is broadband is no longer a nicety. The world has changed. It's been changing actually for decades, but it specifically changed in the last couple of years where, the, where I think many of us in this room can easily understand that to function to properly, day-to-day -day life, uh, more and more of our lives are dependent on high-speed, high-quality internet. Uh, so some of the quotes, the quote you see here, this happens to be a leading voice in the economic development circles, um, and, it, and this was actually a recent quote. You know, this, this issue of broadband um, has now been, uh, been discussed with higher levels of urgency over the last couple of years, and certainly now with resources available, which we'll talk briefly about, you can see people really coalescing around this issue, um, and particularly around community solutions to the issue of broadband. Uh, this is another uh, quote that actually, again, it's sort of timely when we uh, were wrapping up our report, uh, the report that Ezra will speak about. Um, this is actually coming out of the County Commissioners Association of Pennsylvania, and really, again, understanding the emphasis and the diversity of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania uh, we know that there are uh, the Philly and Pittsburgh markets, frankly, have pretty strong broadband coverage, no surprise, but there are a lot of parts of this Commonwealth that are incredibly underserved. 
Lancaster, as you'll see from some of our information, is on the better half, but still kind of in the middle with some of our, our uh, populations and our geography. Um, but I'm going to turn it over to Ezra in just a second, but I just want to do some last minute framing um, and a couple of things that will set the stage for Ezra. Uh, so first of all, uh, when we talk about broadband, when our consultant talks about broadband, and increasingly if you're in conversations, whether it's a state broadband authority with other populations, a lot of the emphasis has been on the infrastructure piece, the technology piece. Can we get fiber? Or in certain geographies, it could be other technologies, but we specifically focus on fiber. Uh, and that's the, the infrastructure, which is really the first A. When you hear people talk about broadband, you'll often hear three A's. Accessibility is the first A. Uh, that's important and equally important to us and in our community based on everything that we've heard through our year and a half journey, or year, year and a half journey, is the affordability and adoption pieces are as important. So you might have access to high speed, high quality internet in your neighborhood, but it's expensive. You know, and we, we actually have, have, have aggregated all of the different services that exist in Lancaster County. So for some people it's $60 a month, but it could be 100, 150 up to $200 a month for high-speed, high-quality internet. That's a lot for a lot of the households in Lancaster County. So we might have it, but if you can't afford it, you don't have access. And similarly, uh, and, and we were just talking to Tyrone about this, you know, they're, they're the digital literacy piece, you might have it, you might be able to afford it, but if you don't actually know how to use a computer or a devices, in, you're, you're not participating in the economy either. And that's still a portion of our community. And it, can be, it, it could be by age demographic, it could be by income, it could be by exposure. It talk, it, we're talking about a lot of things. So these three A's are really fundamental and of equal weight. And we'll talk a little bit about that as, as Ezra jumps in. So let me pass it over to you. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. Um, so this is the most technical we're gonna get today, I promise. Um, but I do wanna do a, a little bit of uh, stage setting um, to really define some terms that we'll be coming back to. So, Number one, uh, the folks that we consider unserved. So these are folks that don't have access to a reliable wireline connection that can provide internet speeds of a download of 25.3, upload of three megabits per second. So that's really the traditional, was in the past, is now antiquated definition of broadband. Internet speeds at 25.3 can not adequately meet uh, the modern needs for an internet user who's working from home, going to school, doing a telehealth visit. We then have a population that we consider underserved. And the definition of underserved is a bit of a moving target right now. Um, it's based on different grants. We'll talk in a minute about how money is flowing uh, from the feds through the state. So we're still waiting on definition here. What I can say is that 100 megabits per second download is the across the board standard definition of the internet that you need today. So if you're trying to work from home to do online meetings, if you're going to school, um, doing a telehealth visit, that 100 megs download is what, again, the needs for today. Um, so anyone who does not have access to, again, a reliable wireline connection that can get them 100 over 100 is considered underserved. Now, what's also important perspective is what do we actually need for the future? And that really is significant fiber optic infrastructure. So fiber optics are considered a quote unquote future proof technology. Um, what's really nice about fiber optics is that they can be expanded uh, to capacity over 10 gigabytes per second. So the benefit there, apart from all the numbers, is a lot of the things that we're gonna be doing on the internet haven't been invented yet. Fiber can potentially meet those needs. Coaxial cable, internet through phone lines and DSL, cannot meet the needs of what we currently need to do, not to mention all the things that have not yet been invented. The other piece of perspective here when we talk about speeds and future needs, um, over the past decade, internet speeds have increased 100 fold. The infrastructure that we're installing today should last a lot more than 10 years. So think about where that might put us. We're not gonna be talking about 25.3 uh, anymore come a couple years. So what did our consultants find? as it relates to infrastructure. The bottom line on infrastructure is that we have between 11 and 17,000 locations, so not people, but locations in Lancaster County that are considered unserved. So again, they don't have reliable wireline access to that inadequate baseline of 25.3 internet. 
So what's also interesting, in addition to the number of folks that are served, is what do those gaps look like? And from our consultant's perspective, that actually makes our community unique. A lot of times when they go into a rural community, there will just be these wide expanses with nothing as far as service. That's not what they found here. Other communities will have many very small gaps. So a rural road with two or three houses at the end of it, which represent very small gaps in service. Um, our consultant found something in between, where the best we can characterize is a category 1.5, we'll just say medium-sized gaps. Um, and that creates some interesting dynamics that, that we'll come back to in a few slides regarding possible solutions to fill these gaps. One thing that I'll highlight is all of the gaps that were identified in Lancaster County are either within the overall footprint or adjacent to the footprint of an existing internet service provider. So again, the key takeaway here, between 11 and 17,000 locations in Lancaster County that are unserved. So note on infrastructure, and Lisa alluded to this, why is this important? Why are we looking at infrastructure now? Um, the short answer is this is a once in a generational, once in a lifetime opportunity to fix broadband infrastructure. Um, there are significant funds that are coming down, primarily from the federal government, that are gonna be flowing through the state. The state is currently standing up their broadband authority, and that's where the money will be coming through. So a lot of what we're doing is watching and waiting uh, to understand what will be the process uh, to go after that funding, um, what are the requirements, and what do we uh, need to provide. In addition to that, uh, folks are probably familiar with uh, the ARPA funding. Um, that funding, we hope, can be leveraged as a local match um, so that we can take most advantage of the federal money coming down and potentially some private sector funding as well. So the last piece I'll highlight on the infrastructure side, um, a very significant portion of our work with CTC was stakeholder engagement. Um, talk about that more in a second too. Uh, but we talk, when we talk to communer, community anchor organizations, whether that's a hospital, higher ed institution, or businesses, across the board we heard significant frustration that there's not the infrastructure in the community to meet their needs either. So that presents us with another interesting opportunity. If we can pull together anchor institutions, we have another significant customer base that could make our market particularly appealing for someone that would want to come in and again build out this infrastructure um, in partnership with us uh, looking at some of these grants. I'll also say what was particularly promising about this, uh, while it might not seem like that big of a deal when we talk to the institutions about partnership and getting free service. They're all happy, happy to be paying customers on adequate infrastructure. So again, it, it's not like folks are saying they just want to log on for free from an institutional perspective. So this is again a big opportunity for us to make our market more appealing. One other piece I want to highlight on institutional infrastructure, um, which was most glaring, is our library system. One of their largest budget items is internet connectivity, and that is to get them 50 megabits of download. So if you recall back, our library system is struggling to get connectivity that still leaves them considered underserved. So you can process that from the institutional and otherwise perspective. Okay, so a little bit more about what we heard from stakeholders. No matter who we talked to, there was significant frustration regarding, in addition to the institutional side, their customers, clients, employees, having reliable enough internet connections to do whatever they needed to do with them. Whether that's job applications, we've all had the experience of being on meetings with people where you can't get through a meeting without someone with connectivity issues. Uh, nonprofits dealing with clients going through challenging situations where they can't obviously see them face to face but can't have a conversation with them. Across the board, we heard about challenges here. So what's interesting about this is what's the cause of these challenges? One, again, we have identified gaps in infrastructure. In addition to that, though, we have these affordability and tech literacy challenges that we're faced with. So something that I think was particularly striking to us in the process, we worked with several school districts. Students who didn't have internet connectivity at home would ask the school districts, most of them were giving out these little hotspots. 
So we mapped the addresses of students who were asking for hotspots, because again, they didn't have internet connectivity at home. And when we looked at that map, the vast majority of those points were in areas where we know there is infrastructure. So that, that really highlights the fact that, again, yes, we know there are gaps in infrastructure. At the same time, a large part of this problem is driven by the fact that people either can't afford to access the internet or don't know how, don't know what to do to get adequate internet access at home. So that really highlights, again, as Lisa mentioned, the importance of the affordability and access issues when we talk about broadband. So I want to highlight a couple of other examples that we heard about that I think really do a good job of illustrating uh, the issues in these areas. One, hearing from libraries. Libraries are really the go-to place uh, for folks that don't have connectivity at home. So one example that they highlighted multiple times, folks went into the libraries to apply for jobs, didn't know how to use a mouse or turn on a computer. Library staff doesn't have the time or capacity to sit there and train them, and there's no centralized training program for them to send people. Libraries also came up with a creative solution where they were using hotspots in parking lots, and they put up a sign with the information for the hotspots so that families could drive up so the kids could do their homework in the library parking lot off hours and then go back home when they were finished. Healthcare institutions. All of the healthcare institutions have significant strategies around telehealth. That's really, as they identified, a big part of the future of healthcare. They all express similar frustrations, getting people online, getting people with the appropriate internet access devices or know-how to use their applications. One other example was from higher education. Multiple schools talked about students who are trying to go to college remotely on a cell phone. <laughs> So you can imagine writing a collegiate level paper on a cell phone. So that goes to an issue of devices. So again, you could see how all of, this, all of these issues start to layer on and we can't solve this problem by just addressing one of them. We also can't solve this problem by letting all of these institutions, in theory and hopefully, letting all of these institutions try to put band-aids on it themselves. They'll all say that they've, they've done their best and they've all done great work to try to help their constituents. They will also all say that it is inadequate and that they need help. So a couple of maps here, um, and this really again starts to show the intersection uh, between the affordability and adoption and infrastructure issues. So when we look at areas, the map on the left are the areas that we consider low investment areas from the infrastructure perspective. So these are areas that have been identified where there are not significant private sector investments that were made to upgrade old infrastructure. At the same time, unsurprisingly, those areas line up with areas of high poverty and line up with the map on the right, which is areas with low computer ownership. Not surprising to anyone, uh, this is especially prevalent in areas uh, with high rural poverty. So again, you can see the, the layering of these issues. Just because we get infrastructure out to an area where hardly anyone owns a computer, they still might not get on the internet unless we can teach them how to and provide them with the appropriate devices. So one more note here uh, on affordability. Uh, as Lisa mentioned, CTC did significant work looking at just the, the pricing of offerings in our community. So the entry point is really $50 a month. And that's, again, for that inadequate 25.3 internet speed. So with a starting point of $50 a month and all of the cost pressure on families, you could see how this quickly becomes unaffordable and gets out of hand. We will say we do have one opportunity um, with Comcast. So Comcast has their Internet Essentials program, which comes in at around $10 a month. Fortunately, Comcast does serve a large portion of our county. That said, there are issues with Internet Essentials. Uh, there are some barriers to entry based on Comcast requirements. And there are, of course, areas that are not served by Comcast. So if you are not in one of those areas and you are a low-income person um, or you're struggling to afford Internet, you're really out of options directly from the internet service providers. Of course. Correct. So. 
So just about everyone will have DSL. That said, DSL can't reliably provide t even 25.3. So that, again, those are our completely unserved areas based on some antiquated mapping. I think what that really shows is red is the Comcast area. So anyone who's not in red has no tiered price offerings based on income. So again, fairly good coverage on the red, but when we talk about getting everyone access to affordable internet, we're not there. So solutions. I know everyone's probably excited to hear about what can we actually do about this, which is the much more exciting part. So one, uh, this is the one that we'll talk about related to infrastructure. As I mentioned before, we have our medium-sized gaps in infrastructure that are either within the footprint of an existing internet service provider or adjacent to the footprint. So the recommendation from CTC is to engage with internet service providers through an RFP process to identify partners who will bring significant dollars to the table and partner with us as a community to seek the federal funding to fill our unserved and hopefully underserved gaps. Again, a big goal in this is that we are shooting for as much fiber optic infrastructure as we can possibly get so that we can prepare ourselves as best we can for the future. So again, engaging with internet service providers, whether they are already here or potentially from outside of the county, which is an interesting option. And that's where our consultant said, again, those medium-sized gaps allow us, they, they might be large enough to attract outside internet service providers to come in because there is enough volume, again, within those medium-sized gaps. So that's a proposed solution on the infrastructure piece. Secondly, and this is important, is ensuring that Lancaster County residents have access to the federal subsidies and tools that are coming down to help with affordability. One more thing uh, that the study found, there's a program called ACP, which is a $30 a month subsidy for to go towards folks' internet bills. Across Lancaster County, we, are, we have 0.01% of our population enrolled in that program around 10% of our population qualifies. Two reasons for that that we can identify. One, no one knows about it. I'd be surprised if any of the folks in this room or many of them heard about ACP. And two, the application process is onerous, difficult, and through the federal government. Um, so we have some opportunities there. That's a huge opportunity. We talk about affordability. There's a subsidy. We need to work to make sure that we get as close to that 10% of our population enrolled as humanly possible. Also on the affordability side, related to Comcast Internet Essentials, it was recommended to explore a bulk purchase agreement with Comcast where we're potentially just buying blocks of Internet Essentials. So any of those stakeholder partners that we talked about, whether it's healthcare, a school, a nonprofit, if they're dealing with clients who are struggling with Internet connectivity, they could say, hey, here is free, no strings attached, Internet to get you hooked up, logged on. We also, in addition to working with Comcast on Internet Essentials, have an opportunity to explore partnerships with other internet service providers to again provide tiered pricing based on income. So if we're doing an RFP, we have some leverage there. And from our initial conversations with internet service providers, uh, others beyond Comcast are willing to explore partnerships to look at pricing a little bit differently, especially as it ties to that $30 a month subsidy. I'll say last, uh, but not least is developing a countywide strategy um, where we can really, again, address these affordability and adoption issues centrally as opposed to relying on each of our school districts, libraries, nonprofits, healthcare systems to solve it on their own. So two specific examples here. One, I mentioned devices. So a lot of, well, we've heard from several organizations who have thought about doing device recycling programs. They just don't want to be involved in a hospital saying, here public, here's our old computers. And then when those computers have issues, they come back to the hospital because that's their best buy. So there's an opportunity here to have a centralized place where multiple organizations can donate devices, we refurbish them, and then give them out. So that we're separating out the initial computer users or donators, apart from giving them credit, to again have somewhere that can get them ready to be used and get them distributed. CTC identified around a computer device gap of around 26,000 devices in Lancaster County. Did I promise two there? Yes, I did. So the other one um, is on tech literacy. 
uh, again, providing some type of centralized curriculum and delivery system so that, again, we can take a more systemic, funded, sustainable approach to teaching people how to get online. So again, we're not leaving you know, overtaxed library staff to add another thing onto their plate. So without getting too much into the weeds, those are the big takeaways um, and solutions that we wanted to share. Uh, before I, we open for questions, I'll turn it back over to Lisa to talk about next steps. Yeah, so there's a couple things. I mean, today's forum is a great example of where we are in our process. Uh, we received the final report from CTC late February, early March, and there's a lot in it. Uh, and there's a lot of just basic education uh, that we're doing, starting with a lot of the stakeholders that we had throughout the process. So Ezra mentioned the libraries, K through 12, IU 13, healthcare systems, businesses, uh, some of the other segments of our community like ag uh, and faith-based, right? So we're out, we're out on the circuit right now, sharing with everyone what our uh, study is saying. And starting to get some feedback and as people try to process what is it that we're going to do, and I want to talk about that in a second. Um, an important piece here, Ezra mentioned it briefly, but throughout our process, uh, we have erred on being inclusive with um, as many people as we can be, including the internet service providers. So uh, Ezra mentioned Comcast, there's certainly Windstream, Blue Ridge, there's a number of other providers that are in our county. We've had an open conversation with them, and right now, they're a key conversation that we're having. So we've had a couple of them this week, and actually next week is when we're meeting with most of the internet service providers. Um, and they've been, frankly, fairly forthcoming and happy to be um, having the conversation with us. Often people don't include them and then come at them at the end as sort of the enemy, and, and that's really not how we've approached it. I would also just add, um, we've also been in touch with PPL, uh, because if you think about where... Uh, cable lines have to go, they have to attach to poles. So let's not forget them. And so we've had conversations with them also along the way uh, so they know what we're doing. And just one point on the internet service providers piece and just the landscape overall before I get to um, the, to the wrap-up here. This landscape over the last 12 months uh, for internet service providers particularly, let alone the consultants who under, underpin this industry, this is chaos. I mean, if you think, there's never been, I mean, there, we're talking about billions of dollars coming into the system. Communities across the country are all grappling with this, all at the same time. So we felt really uh, fortunate, I would say we were wise, to engage CTC, a national consultant, when we did, because you can't get them now. They're so oversubscribed. And most of the, uh, a lot of the counties in the Commonwealth and others are scrambling to try to get technical expertise or figure out how to do it. So we're ahead of the curve in that way. And the internet service providers, at least the ones we've started to talk to already, they're overwhelmed. <laughs> I mean, it is overwhelming. Some of it's because they can see that there's opportunities for partnership. There's certainly huge amounts of subsidies out there. They want to take advantage of that. They're hearing from communities of all shapes and sizes coming at them in all different ways. There is no one size fits all here. Uh, that's true across the country and in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, which is frankly further behind because we're only just now standing up a statewide broadband authority. It is every county to itself, and in, in many cases, many municipalities unto themselves, and we know the landscape of Pennsylvania. So if you, you know, I just, we have to keep that in mind they're going to go where the easiest path is and where they can figure out how to pair up and do what they can in their business interest. That's business. Uh, so it's th these conversations with the ISPs, I think, have been particularly helpful that we set the stage with them, but important that we keep the lines of communication open and we understand where they are in their process and they understand where we are. Um, we have been out talking with a whole bunch of stakeholders, including our elected officials at the local and the state level and at the municipal level. Uh, that is an important part of this landscape. Um, most of us, I would say, um, what we've learned is during the pandemic and before, if you have a, an issue with your internet, your first call isn't to your municipal manager or a county commissioner or even your state rep, right? We all call Comcast or whoever you have. <laughs> So for a lot of the elected officials, this isn't a sweet spot of theirs. They don't have deep technical knowledge. This isn't an issue they've dealt with a lot of. Now they're getting some funding or access to funding that specifically says use it for broadband. So part of what we're trying to do is educate them on, on what the situation is in the community 
And then also what's, what, they're, what we've heard from a lot of their stakeholders and our, their constituents. So all of us are on that learning curve together. And then this is really where we are right now, uh, is on the forefront of what's the implementation plan for Lancaster County. The work that we did with CTC and with our partners at the STEM Alliance, and I should also credit IU13 and Penn Medicine Lancaster General helped fund the study along with EDC and the STEM Alliance. Uh, they didn't set out an implementation plan. That's our job as a community. Not our job EDC, but as a community. They gave us the technical information we need to make our decisions. Uh, so what we're doing now is briefing everyone to say, here's our landscape, and now the discussion is, what do we as a community want to do, choose to do about that? And, and really that's where, um, as we wrap up and turn to questions, uh, this is just a little framing I'll share with you and I would encourage Ezra to jump in as well. There's no model. And when we look at our peers across the Commonwealth, uh, neighboring counties, everyone's coming at this differently. Um, if you look at York, uh, York's, York is way different. <laughs> Uh, and you can say it's great or you can say it's crazy. They, have, they are building out a county-owned infrastructure where they have put tens of millions of dollars of their own money in it. And they started that a year ago, a year and a half ago, yeah. Uh, so they are loads ahead of, I would say, everyone, but with a model that is a little bit unproven or could be, it's, it's a long-term play that they're making. Uh, we're seeing other communities that are figuring out, is there a public-private partnership? What role could the municipalities or the county government have to leverage the internet service providers and work together? And we're seeing places where it's ba basically, we don't know what we're doing, we just hope someone comes in and fixes it for us. Uh, the other piece of this is, on, especially on the affordability and adoption side, these aren't new issues. So a lot of communities have been tackling these in certain ways, and, and, and I would say in Lancaster County, part of our journey over the last year is to be so grateful and thankful for the higher ed institutions, the educational K through 12, the libraries, uh, our healthcare institutions, what they have done under extraordinary circumstances to serve people of all income levels in our community, it is extraordinary. And it's, a, it's too much. It's not gonna, in my opinion, assuming that they're going to, in their own silos, raise the boats for everyone in Lancaster County. To me, uh, what we've seen is they've done as much as they can do and we're at that point where they've gotta do a pass off. Uh, but thank goodness they did what they did and it's amazing. But it's, so some com communities are saying, let those institutions keep carrying it on and we can figure it out. And others, and, and, and others are lining up more with what our consultant was recommending, which is a much more centralized approach. Um, is this a community priority? Uh, do we want to look not just for infrastructure today, because a lot of people are saying, how do we build out the infrastructure just to get current? If you think about the northern tier of Pennsylvania, so far behind in their infrastructure, they'll take anything because anything's better than, than nothing they have. Well, we're in, a much, we're in a better position than they are. So our opportunity is not to just get everyone served today, but as Ezra said, let's look at the standard where we can be uh, at, at where we need to be for 10 years from now. So we don't have to keep doing the investments, but that we're positioning ourselves competitively for success. Um, so that's where we are today. There's no implementation plan. Um, EDC has brought this analysis to this point with the STEM Alliance. As Liz knows, we're actively discussing what role we should or shouldn't have going in the future. There's, this is not, uh, there's a lot of things on this that, that align with where EDC is and certainly supporting the business community. And there's also aspects of this where there could be better or different institutions or uh, organizations in Lancaster County uh, that have more, uh, more of a connection to it. Um, what I will say is, if we're, as a community, if we decide that broadband is important and we want to capitalize on the opportunity that's of the moment, which is all of this funding that's out there, uh, this isn't a short-term play. This isn't, oh, hey, let this organization dabble in this. This is a five to ten year commitment. It needs to be funded. It needs to be staffed. It needs to have leadership. And that's what's going to get us from where we are today to something different than where we are today. Uh, so what role EDC plays in that? We're actively discussing that. We're actively talking to a lot of the social service organizations like United Way, CAP, the Chamber, Community Foundation, a number of the folks across the landscape. But it's a daunting task. This is not a light lift. Uh, and so I think that's uh, part of what's been impressed upon us over the last year. Anything I missed before we can turn it over to questions or comments? No. Great. Any questions or comments? Because you guys can ask or if there's anything online. 
I would be curious if people were surprised by the findings. Art. I'm going to ask people, if you don't mind, just so the people on the live stream can hear you, if you can speak into the mic and just say your name. Art, man, where does the uh, Kimber system fit into your plans? Uh, so the, great question. So the, the Kim, I'm going to try not to get too much into a rabbit hole. The, the Kimber system is another, um, it, it's an institutional fiber network meant to serve uh, higher ed institutions in large part. Um, the interesting thing with Kimber and their system is it was just acquired by First Light, um, who's private. So that's a question that we're still working on answering. Um, Kimber as an organization is potentially an interesting opportunity because they just sold their main asset and have significant experience in building out networks. So they're, they're, they're a partner that we talk to monthly um, and they, they could be good going forward. Uh, Jerry Eckerd, nice presentation. I guess I shouldn't be surprised about how much I don't know in my mid 70s. So this is this was a nice presentation. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, question and uh, maybe a recommendation. So, is there data that you have of corporations that are discouraged from moving here mm. because we don't have the Infrastructure as well as the labor? <laughs> the infrastructure and the labor. Um, uh, so my short answer is no, there's no data on that. I would also say anecdotally, we haven't heard access to broadband as a significant deterrent on business operations, what we, from, at least from businesses coming in. What we have heard anecdotally from some local businesses is uh, so, some, depending on where they are, and especially if they have remote workers, just a lot of frustration about overall connectivity. Um, some we've heard, uh, particularly for businesses that need redundancy, a lot of frustration over cost and coordination with the existing internet service providers. Um, so, you know, even a small or mid sized business, how much of their budget? Um, and how much of their time is required to navigate, set that up, and manage that. Uh, when, if it's really, truly um, ubiquitous to business, it should be easier. They're willing to pay something for it. They're not looking for it for free, but it's just too complicated. Uh, but not in terms of an attraction issue. I, I mean, to be honest, no, we haven't heard that. Labor, uh, um, to be honest, the, the businesses that, that want to be in Pennsylvania right now, um, unfortunately, it's such a mad rush on the land that they feel like they can deal with the labor after the fact, and then they look to us and the Workforce Development Board to tell them to fix their labor issue. It's a whole different discussion so, topic. <laughs> thanks. So under the key recommendations, I think it should be more specific about uh, the need for computer literacy. And I don't know, you can ask Bob Hollister whether it's easy or hard to get a requirement, another requirement for, for schools you know, here. But I just think there's, besides the education, uh, there needs to be a greater push, I think, with higher education. I think it should be more specific about how we can keep the labor in Lancaster. Um, so, For whatever that's worth, I probably didn't say it well, but... Um, I'm, make, I'm making that's, my notes. That's what I think, for what it is. I'll, I'll ask Bob uh, whether it's hard. Thanks, Jerry. I, I thought my superintendent days were behind me. Um, so this is an adult issue, not a, not a kid issue. The kids are, are natives to all of this. You know, even at Eastern Lancashire County School District, we were a one-to-one -one, uh, device district for 10 years now. So it's trying to capture adults, even, even myself. I, I go to my 13-year-old daughter now to fix my tech stuff. Like, so it... it that's an issue, but it's a very real issue. I look at my father, he's 82, and he struggles to, and I, I know it's, it's, it's a joke, but he struggles to turn the computer on. Mm -hmm. And so that's where we got to target that. No, it's really not the schools. Hi, Monty Miller. Um, trying to understand the Kimber answer. Uh, Hourglass was involved over the last decade of Kimber, and for those of you who don't know, that came out of the Obama administration's uh, efforts to roll out uh, 
fiber optic cable, which they did throughout a large part of Pennsylvania. Uh, and at the time we were looking at it, there was a significant amount of the fiber optic that went through uh, our county. Mm -hmm. um, the comment was correct that it went to education because we were involved because there wasn't enough people in Harrisburg to, to uh, educate the local people of what was available, so Hourglass got involved. And the easiest place for us to go was the F and Millersville, Stevens Technology, Lancaster Country Day, et cetera. Uh, but the cable is not tied to education. It is a tremendous. That's why I'm trying to understand the answer and why we couldn't move off of that. We were hopeful. We moved out of it, as Hourglass has to do over time, when it had the possibility of leaking up to the library to the, uh, the uh, city, but other people had interest, and we let them move on. So I, I'd like to know a little bit more if you'd help me. Yeah, and so that's... That's a great question and comment, and that's somewhere, so what, one of the initial steps that we started with was saying, okay, we want ubiquitous fiber to the premise in Lancaster County, so let's look at the existing fiber backbone, and then we would look at maps of the fiber optic cables running through Lancaster County, and we found a ton of them, honestly. Um, all of our schools are connected via a great uh, fiber optic network run through IU-13. We can't access that because of the E-rate federal subsidy program, there's all stuff around that. Um, a lot of the vast majority of the fiber is owned by X, Y, or Z company. Again, Kimber is going to be first light at this point, and it's, it's, it's privately owned infrastructure, and we can't dictate to them. It's based on their interests, how they intend to use it, um, and what the purposes are. And there are a lot of companies that own fiber optics that are in the ground that don't have any intention um, of sending it to the premise or opening it up for individual service. It's it's their decision as companies. Um, there are communities that have tried to access it, um, and it's what we heard from our consultant, what we learned in starting to talk to folks is, uh, unfortunately, it's, it's a struggle or not necessarily a viable strategy to chase down all of those private fiber owners. And so, I mean, I think, so it's an asset in the community for sure, mm -hmm. and whether it can be leveraged to do any of this stuff is still a question mark to us yep. because the, the lines of communication are open, but because of the transition of the ownership, um, we don't have a clear sense of that today. Does it mean it could couldn't change mm -hmm. in the next you know months or year? We don't know. And I would just add that anyone who's got fiber optic assets right now or these internet service providers, it is a crazy landscape. So we're one piece of that, as you know. Uh, and how they're looking at their whole system, I think, is part of what they're digesting before we can figure out, does it line up with where we are? So it's a, it is an asset for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it maybe could be leveraged, but I think we would, right now, based on the landscape, anything in Lancaster County, with some exceptions, could be leveraged. And that's really the, the approach that we're trying to take, is how do you, because we have multiple Lancaster County, the opportunity we have, which is different than others, is to work with those partners and have them build out further networks. We don't have to start from scratch. To do that effectively, in our opinion and based on our consultant, that requires a coordinated effort because right now what we have, I mean, this is what we're hearing from all the internet service providers. They're looking at all their territories and figuring out where can they go first in to do expansions that make sense. So does that answer your question, Monty? The sad thing is in our day, long ago, Kimber was a public operation and mm -hmm. apparently uh, I'm so old it's been sold and that's the tragedy because if it wasn't I think it would be a great place right. to leverage. Yeah, the transition. yeah I, I, I will say what one benefit is through the RFP process there's no reason why First Light couldn't apply using those assets. Mm -hmm. I have a question for y'all. You mentioned in the report there's 11,000 to 17,000 households that are unserved but that unserved is kind of an outdated benchmark for looking at internet access. So how many households in Lancaster County don't have access to the real high-speed internet they would need to work in telehealth and do their education? So the, the, short, the short answer is we don't know. Mm -hmm. um, as we mentioned, so the, the speeds are, are really dynamic. Uh, several months ago when CTC was working on this, the standard was 25.3, um, as best we knew for the grants coming down. Um, as the folks that we could serve, it's in the past six months significantly changed. Uh, without going down too much of a rabbit hole, th there's no silver bullet to mapping or figuring this out. The, the other aspect of an RFP process 
is going to the internet service providers, which they have expressed a willingness to do, to provide us with address level data on what they can provide. That's the best way uh, to figure it out. So hopefully through that RFP process, uh, we will be able to get a better understanding of that, that middle piece, the underserved folks. I think what, what I'll add to this is, again, we want fiber. We want fiber to the premises. And we hardly have any fiber to the premises in Lancaster County. So the flip of this is we could almost consider anybody without fiber to the premises to be underserved and try to attack them. And that, that could be another, another way, another approach to doing this. Um, just two things. One is, have you been talking with Glow Fiber, who's coming in, um, about their their expansion path? Because they're in all the metro areas right now. That's Ch is that Chantel's Chantel. product? That's Chantel. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, because they're not going to go anywhere where there's where Comcast hasn't already built out. So they're going to go to the low hanging fruit first. Yeah. But I think there is an opportunity for local government as well as some some private partnerships to extend their trunk line down a section of road to get to that next developed area um, and then there's a hopefully the competition with Comcast starts to pick up because they're they're doing some they're they're moving pretty quick the other comment or, or question would be uh, why the focus on fiber to the door and not high-speed internet to the door because we have there's there's three over-the-air options currently either there or coming Starlink is already here upward broadband is already here and 5G is, is right around the corner. Um, and between those three, have you, have you done a comparison of the cost per user of build-out infrastructure of fiber versus the cost per user of subsidizing over-the-air high-speed internet? Yeah, so um, to your, so let me go with the first one first. So we, we have been talking to Chantel, they're an eager partner. Just like you said, they're gonna build in the low-hanging fruit areas. They're not gonna by themselves solve the rural issue. Um, kind of tying that to Diana's question, if, if the unserved people are the farthest out and we're building from the most densely populated areas where there inf is infrastructure to the farthest out most rural areas, we're also passing everybody in the middle, which you implied. So that, that's another way that we get to the underserved through the unserved. Um, related to your question about other technologies, um, b building, building out fiber is the most expensive way to go. It is also the best way to go. Um, from, all right, well, we can, we can have a debate on technologies. Um, that, that said, from, from a capacity and reliability perspective and from a proven technology perspective, from our consultant's perspective, again, that's what they recommend. So if we have an opportunity with all this significant funding, we're going to look, for, again, as our consultants recommended, at the longest lasting, best capacity infrastructure that we can provide. That said, and th this is where everybody else comes in and we've had great conversations uh, with Upward Broadband, um, we likely can't get fiber to everyone. And that's where these other technologies come in. We want to get just the most fiber we possibly can. Where we can't do that on the most rural areas and the farthest out areas, that's where we want to leverage the other technologies to build off of fiber. I'll, I'll just add with 5G and a lot of these, I, a lot of them are built on a fiber backbone anyway. So a lot of it requires a ton of fiber regardless of how you're getting to the farthest out points. I'll just add in too. I mean, there's a lot of discussion on technologies. And as you point out and as we're all learning, the technology is changing as we speak. So we're, I think that collectively what we're all trying to figure out is in this moment what's the right path and then how do you, how do you forge a path for five to ten years and try to do it the right way. So uh, there's, this, this, is, this gets to the implementation strategy and what does Lancaster County want to do? Uh, and, um, and so yes, we, we have some of the, we have a good understanding, moving understanding of implementation costs and there's a lot of expense. The last thing any of us want to do is be reckless with that expense. These, even though there's a lot of money out there, there's a lot of places that need it and we want to be careful with the public dollars that we have. Uh, that's really why we're encouraging the RFP process, though, because right now, it's the, even in Lancaster County, it's the Wild West. And you're right, we have some good people with good solutions that are trying to figure it out. They're figuring it out on their own. And they're racing as fast as they can because there's money on the table and they think they have the best solution. And it, maybe they do. Maybe they do. And hallelujah if they figure it out. Our thinking is we also want to figure out what the community conversation is and where does the community want to go. 
and, and who's the most important constituents to us? Who do we care about the most? What are those priorities? And can we at least set some context, set some guardrails for the Chantels and the Upwards and the Comcasts and the Blue Ridge and the people we don't even know that know we have population density here, that we're an interesting market because we're growing off of Philadelphia and Baltimore. We know they're here. But do we want to coordinate that conversation or do we want to just let them run it? This isn't our call. This isn't EDC's call. This is the question we're posing to everyone we talk to. And someone, is, collectively, we've got to figure out that answer. So I appreciate, the, I mean, this is, you're, you're right. There's a lot of different technologies out there. This is the guidance we're getting from our national expert and what we think is the best path for Lancaster County, but it's not the only path. Mm -hmm. But it does sound like, I was asking, are you making a case for one authority overseeing this? No, 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 no. Let's be clear on that. <laughs> um, go ahead. You. Yeah, so you use the word authority. So one, not, not an authority um, and not necessarily one internet service provider. That, that's another beauty of this RFP process um, is we, honestly, we would probably hope that it would be multi-award uh, where we're working with multiple partners in dif different areas with multiple technologies. Mm -hmm. And, and you, you open the door, Jerry, on a question that's important because the big question is who issues the RFP? Who could issue the RFP? Um, and I don't have an answer for you right now. Uh, you know, in our conversations with the county, they've been very clear from the beginning which, that they don't want to own the infrastructure, which is why our report, really our report doesn't have any county ownership over it. Could they issue the RFP because they have good procurement processes? That's a possibility, and to me, the door on that is still open and, a, and an open discussion. And we've also talked to the IU-13, you know, because they do a lot of procurement and they've done a lot. Uh, could they do something like that? Uh, that's a possibility. For either, for anyone who does it, it's a big responsibility. That, that's not a small task, and it steps, it, it pushes you into a leadership role regardless of if they want it or not. It's why we're hesitating on it. EDC doesn't do, you know, $100 million procurement every day. We don't have a procurement office. We don't even have enough staff members right now. So, you know, so this is a daunting challenge, but it's a fair question. You know, it's, it's a fair question of who steps forward and says, this is important enough, and, and we want to leverage the dollars we have. We want to leverage the dollars that are coming down, and, and we have the internal capabilities to do that. I don't, we don't have the answer. Yeah, Art Man. I'm, that brings up... The idea of whether or not you have a, just like the sewer authority or the waste authority, whether you need a communication authority, because the state and the county and the municipalities all have roads. This is the new road system. Second thing, when you have too many different companies involved in an infrastructure issue, you have to think about America's approach to nuclear power. Uh, having been in that field, uh, you have Babcock Wilcox build Three Mile Island, their first one. You have General Electric down at, you know, Peach Bottom, and you have, you know, the Westinghouse reactors, and France glomped onto the Westinghouse reactor from the Navy, right? So every nuclear power plant in France is the same, same technology, same pump, same everything. So it's easy to train, much more reliable. And so while we have nuclear power in the United States, it's a bit of a mishmash, and probably not as safe and as as uh, effective as what it could have been. Key, so key, one, key ones. <laughs> oh, sorry, okay, right. Um, which of the one or two that you think would be the best to focus on to get outcomes, traction and outcomes quickest? We might not be on the same page. You go first. I was gonna, no, I was going to say you go first. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad I asked the question. I'm going to see who wins both. this one. You're going first. It's a, it's a good question, Bob. Um, I've gone, I had, I had been hopeful that we could move quickly on the RFP and the infrastructure piece because it felt timely and because it feels like we're a little bit ahead with the CTC report. Um, given Jerry's question and the who, um, I, since we don't have a solution to that, I feel like we're losing ground on that as, a, as the lead, as the lead place that we were going to start. Uh, so right now, um, there, I, I do think there's opportunities, particularly with the federal subsidy um, being out there, and particularly given uh, the landscape of social service providers and healthcare providers, where there seems to be some energy from people saying, let's at least start on the affordability and the adoption ones. Um, so that, so my knee-jerk reaction to you is the path of least resistance right now, and where there could be some opportunity to get some traction and visibility would be 
around affordability and adoption and leveraging the, the work that those partners have already done into something more cohesive moving forward. Yeah, I, I'll take a somewhat similar approach. I'll just add that on the, <laughs> I'm gonna be slightly different. Uh, so on, uh, w one, we're, we're waiting to the state, for the state to figure out what they wanna do and that's, that's gonna drive a lot of how we handle the infrastructure. So even if we wanted to sprint at that, we're still really had, held back by Pennsylvania. Um, two, I, I, I would probably say number four, um, that would lead into number two and three. So it, it's it's what we're doing now. It's the talking to folks, it's the coalition building, it's getting folks to, to really recognize that, well, they all recognize that it's an issue of the stakeholders that we've talked to, but that there are solutions, there are ways that we can work together. Uh, if we can get the, you know, the right folks in the right seats, then we're in a much better position to do two and three quickly, and then number one, when the opportunity arises, uh, when Pennsylvania gets around to it. Uh, Liz Martin, just real quick, you mentioned about the potential for 25% local matching funds. Mm -hmm. Is that imperative to get a match, to get this money that's coming from the federal down to the state, or is it just like not necessary to have the, the, uh, a match to get the money? So it's a moving landscape. We've heard different things from different people. So, um, and part of it is because so much of the federal money that's in a number of different pots, the guidelines for that, it's still moving through. So some of it historically has said, uh, what we've, what we've been told is that some sort of local match has been required, which is what our consultant really highlighted for us. Um, we don't know what the state broadband authority is going to do. We actually um, have calls, there's joint calls coming up next week where we might start to hear some insight as they, th they have 100 million coming in and they're, they're gonna get a ch chunk of a couple hundred other million coming in. So it sounds like they're moving toward closer toward having a sense of how they might be pushing that out and when and what that could look like. Um, so we, we will see. Um, we certainly, in talking to the internet service providers, um, you know, th they're looking at making investments, so they could be part of the local match as well. Uh, but what components of, who has to have what components is uh, a jump ball at this point. Hey, Milner again. Uh, come back to the technology question. Uh, like it or not, one of the great advantages you folks have is providing information and a structure for people to think about. Uh, I'm interested in the decision of your consultants that uh, what I would call the Cadillac solution is put the last mile on fiber directly to the uh, location in contrast to 5G uh, as a solution because it appears that the world is moving aggressively to 5G and you'll have more people headed that way than the last mile on, on, fiber, on optics to the house. And that recommendation is, is an interesting one from your consultants, and I wonder why they set, came to it. Um, so, good question, and I, I, I'm not technical, so I'd, I'd almost have to let our consultants answer that question. From, from my perspective, again, what I can say is that the nature of 5G is many little antennas. Um, I can also say, that phone companies love 5G because they can charge a lot more for it, and that's a lot of times why they don't use all that fiber to go to people's homes. So if we're talking about a more affordable option, it, it has proven in the past to be a, a wire to a house. Again, that's how I understand it. I'm, I can't go too far down the technical road because I'm not a technical broadband person. I don't know if you have any additions there. The only addition I would have is um, the landscape is so unclear right now that I think our consultant responded to us in the STEM Alliance saying what's possible and let's not shortchange ourselves by, mm -hmm. by saying let's, let's go for something moderate. So you're right, it, it, it is a Cadillac version. Is that, you know, where do we want Lancaster to be? Do we want Lancaster to be in the middle of the pack? Do we want it to be at the front of the pack? Or do we want to be behind? You know, do we, do we practically think that fiber to every household in Lancaster County is possible? You know, but why not frame it that way and then figure out, you know, based on some of the questions even here, are there better technologies? How does it evolve? What does the funding stream look like? This is all the current conversation. But if, as a community leader in Lancaster County, I would rather say, here's the aspirational goal and how far can we get toward it as a saying, let's set our sights at 10% at, at and yay, we made it. That's the framing. Uh, I think, I mean, even from the questions today that, you know, we're gonna be sorting that through um, and that's why this is a community conversation. <clears throat> 
Yeah, and I, I know we have to go, but my other comment on that is that's why a coordinated approach in the county and having some leadership around what is it that we want, because talking to, we're talking to a lot of the players now, it's a lot of our time just to talk to every single one of them. You, add, you start adding in the Verizons and the, you know, all of that sort of stuff. Someone has to be talking to those people. I'm just not sure who that's going to be leading that discussion. But it does you know, if people are going to pay, if people are going to pay us to staff up to do it, we we might consider it. Uh huh. Well, thank you so much. Our hour is up for today, so I'm be, I'm sure Ezra and Lisa will hang out if people have a few more questions. But um, let's give them a round of applause and thank them for coming out and sharing all about the broadband strategy for Lancaster County. Uh, a recording of today's talk will be on our YouTube channel next week and our website, so please feel free to share that with other people in the community who need to be part of this conversation as we move it forward. Our next First Friday Forum will be Friday, June 3rd. That will be with the Lancaster Conservancy. They will be kicking off Water Week with us and sharing details about their uh, Protect and Restore Natural Lands and Streams campaign, what they're doing both here in Lancaster and York counties. Uh, to receive invitations to all of our First Friday forums, please become an Hourglass member. You can do that on our website at hourglasslancaster.org. And until then, have a great weekend. Thanks. Thank you.